Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Gavin Tucker, of having utter contempt for the commentary crews of modern MMA. Jack Slack and it's the Jack Slack podcast, episode 13. Ooh, do we say that? It's the Scottish episode, as they'd say in the theatre. Coming at you on Wednesday, the 10th, and we're doing it on Wednesday because typically I put these out on like Friday, and then we get half the view count, and views trickling over the weekend while people think that that's my opinion on the fights and then they have to wait till monday for me to actually talk about them so dropping it on wednesday if this goes well monday wednesday might be our usual split for two potty weeks but we'll see and and honestly uh just to catch you all up the the name change really did seem to help like a lot more people are finding my stuff just by typing jack slack in the youtube bar or the google bar or whatever Though I do have to re-record my intro every episode because I say it's your boy Jack Slack, Fights Gone By podcast. But it's a price I'm willing to pay and I'll learn to live with it. And we've got some interesting stuff going on this weekend. Um, Interesting in the I really love fights sort of way. Not interesting in the like this will get lots of people to view the the product sort of way. But we'll get into that later. A few bits of news just come up recently. And we we haven't really talked about news lately. You know, we used to start the show with it and then I just sort of got into going straight into the fights but I feel like if you're tuning into this one for Leon Edwards versus Bilal Muhammad you're probably not a casual (laughs) so I think we could probably chat about news for a little bit and you can jump ahead if you want to get straight into the fights I think the biggest piece of news going on right now is that uh, you know as we record this people are freaking out over whether well not no one's really freaking out over whether the UFC cuts the featherweight division because it's just been announced that Megan Anderson, uh, her contract has ended, and now that's being reported as like, oh my god, are they cutting her immediately following this? And I, I can't think they would. I think they'd probably keep her around for one more, you know, just to make things look legit. Uh, they kept Felicia Spence around, but I think did she get that? Did she did she scrape down to bantamweight at one point? I can't remember, but she's still around. So then you got other people like uh, Raymondi came out this morning being like, just checked. Apparently they're not cutting the division or shuttering the division or whatever he said. Um, and I think probably what's happened there is that your girl Megan Anderson did the thing that all the smart fighters do. If they have extreme confidence, they go into the title fight on the last fight of their contract and they go, I'll renegotiate when I'm sitting here with the belt. And that can work really well. Was it Weidman who did that? I think maybe. But some guys have done that to incredible effect. And honestly, I was thinking about this with Aljo. What I'd love to see from him is just uh, a a straight Jeff Jarrett move. If you don't know the Jeff Jarrett story, Jeff Jarrett was a jobber. He was was an all right guy in the early WWF. He got the the Intercontinental title, I think it was. And Vince Russo was his mate and booked him to win the title just as his contract expired. So uh, Jeff Jarrett famously was like, I'm not going to defend the belt without more money. So he basically held up Vince McMahon for, I think it was something like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 uh, to do one night's work. And he dropped the belt to China, you know, the, the lady. Um, and that was the first, uh, the only woman to win the Intercontinental title. And they were doing huge things with China anyway. But yeah, so basically Jarrett got a ton of money, burned all his bridges at the WWF. And, uh, but then he used that money to start uh, TNA and all sorts of other things. So uh, it was really interesting. So I'm saying if you're uh, Aljo, you know, because you've got the belt, even if you didn't really win it in the way that people... Oh, I'm not even going to dig into that issue again because I, I got so many comments on the last uh, body, just people being like, obviously there's no excuse for not knowing the rules as a champion, but... And then brackets, excuses about not knowing the rules as the champion. Other bits of news are that the Venom deal's coming into effect. They're going to have their first uniforms. I think it was April 10th. So everyone's going to have edgy snakes on their trunks. And that's the real downside about um, Venom. I mean, I I am not sponsored by any brands. I don't have a, a Slack X scramble or Slack X Nawaza deal or anything. But there are some brands that I really do appreciate in, in uh, no gi and MMA gear. And uh, others that you don't. And Venom is very, like, skulls and eagles era MMA design. And we're going to talk all about this later because, you know, we're talking about how fighters become stars. And there's a lot of things that, that can make a fighter a star. And an interesting look is one of them. Like if you watch um, any of the Rise events, like all those lads 
bleach blonde their hair or just do their hair in different weird ways. You see the odd punch perm, you know, all sorts of things. And that's always been like a way to stand. I mean, obviously, uh, not many natural blondes in Japan or gingers. Uh, so dudes do all sorts of interesting things with their hair to stand out. And trunks, obviously, a huge one in kickboxing too. But, you know, you, you're trying to make a fucking brand for yourself as a fighter. And it's not easy when they're like giving you a school uniform to wear to do it. And then they're doing Rose versus um, Wei Li or Zhang, uh, again, uh, at uh, UFC 261. That'll be good. I saw the opening line on this was like Rose at two to one, which again is like kind of like Yan being two to one the other week. You're going, well, I, you know, I might think they're not going to win, but I'm not two to one. I mean, to be fair, people are going to get mad at me because I moan about people scoring split decisions on their own. But I'm definitely not two to one kind of confident that Zhang wins that. And I wasn't two to one kind of confident that... um, Blahovich would lose to uh, Adesanya. It's it's crazy some of these lines that you've seen recently. And then the other weird one this week was that Dan Hardy uh, has parted with the UFC. And lots of info not being released on that, as in like no one really knows what that's about. Um, but basically, I think it was Meltzer, uh, the big tuner, revealed it first that they they just weren't working together anymore. And um, said that it was it was due to an argument with a uh, with a female employee and bjpen.com or whoever ran with Dan Hardy argues with female employee block caps you know but um or incident with female I can't remember what it was but it was just like if you emphasize the female part everyone immediately thinks that there was some nefarious thing to that when really it was probably just an argument between two employees <laughs> this is what you mean um but whatever the case Hardy is apparently out Which is a real shame because, you know, with all the moaning we've been doing about commentary lately, I think Dan Hardy's very good at his job. I think Dan Dan Hardy and John Gooden is a great uh, booth. Adfelder, they still work quite well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good. It's just, it's disappointing because I would rank Hardy and, oh God, watching all these Leon Edwards fights, the the old ones and the old Bilal Muhammad ones too, um, got some Stan and Anik and that is a, a quality booth. Brian Stan was a gift to this sport. We used to get along back in the day anyway, because he used to, he used to uh, read me and, and um, he used to read the odd article and, and uh, tell people about it. But he always just struck me as someone who really did their research, because even back at the, in those times, like I was writing articles about people who were catching on or who I cared about. And Brian Stan was coming in, knowing about every fighter on the card, having spoken to them, watched some of their regional fights. You know, he was he really did his uh, due diligence and it showed through on the broadcast. Unfortunately, he's good at other things, <laughs> and those other, and obviously passionate about those other things. So uh, he left a little while ago. Um, but I think he'd be he'd be really appreciated in the modern landscape of the UFC booth. Everyone last week was like, "Jack, you need to go back and listen to the commentary." And I started, but I didn't bother. And then I saw that there was some highlights on Twitter and um, Reddit MMA. So I watched some of those and I went, "Mm, I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't bother. I don't need to lay into that. I mean, everyone else already has. Uh, Yeah, it's just like getting sloppy. You know, it's it's not. I don't like DC Rogan and Anik. I think they're all very capable and, you know, extend that to Felder and whoever else has been on the recent ones. It's just that I think especially without the crowd and the atmosphere, it feels a lot less formal and they treat it that way and it becomes a podcast. It must honestly be hard, you know, for Big John and Goldie before the lockdown. They were sitting in arenas packed with 200, 300 fans. And, uh, you know, you've got however many screaming fans behind you and you're still going, did I ever tell you about the one time Art Davey came to me and said, I want to do a fighting promotion. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's got to be difficult to do that. So hopefully it all picks up again when we get fucking crowds back. But um I might listen to this one too with the with the audio off. Anyway, let's talk about these fights coming up this weekend. UFC Vegas 21, whatever the fuck that means. Um I, I, it baffles me when websites use the number to to uh say what UFC event it is. Just use the names. Like it's so confusing otherwise. Um but the the obvious fight that we're all interested in aside from Gavin Tucker versus Dan Ige, which we are all interested in. We got Leon Edwards versus Bilal Muhammad in the main event. And this is the reason that this podcast is going to have half the listens of the last one. But, um, you know, I'm going to say just I like both of these fighters a lot um, and I have for a while. But I also recognize that there are bits missing 
from them. Like there are very obvious bits missing from both men that are preventing them from becoming stars. And we're going to talk a little bit about like how hard it is to become a star anyway, because Leon Edwards and Bilal Muhammad, both very good technicians, very good, um, you know, g- good athletes, good technicians, everything you could possibly need to be a good fighter. And what separates them from someone like uh, Jorge Masvidal? Because obviously half the thing is like Leon Edwards wants to fight Jorge Masvidal. Jorge Masvidal is like, no, I will have the title shot on Nate Diaz, please. And Jorge Masvidal can do that because until very recently, he was Leon Edwards. You know, as someone who followed Leon, uh, you know, Jorge Masvidal through all the like split decisions on undercards against uh, Lorenz Larkin. Now, if you're a casual fan, you're looking down Masvidal's records going, what knockouts can I watch? You are not watching his, you know, medium pace but very technically slick fight with Lorenz Larkin for most people Jorge Masvidal's 50 fight career starts at Donald Cerrone and really only got momentum with the three knockouts back to back Darren Till uh, Ben Askren Nate Diaz I mean he didn't even knock out Nate Diaz really it was a it was the referee saved Jorge Masvidal from the fifth round <laughs> no, but you know you know what I mean three stoppages back to back that is what people can cling to and that is what broke him through. Also helped, of course, that the Askren one was one of the fastest knockouts ever. Anything that works in GIF form, you know, like uh, as much as it, it hurts the UFC when people are like, you yeah, know, I don't want to watch the Ronda Rousey fight. I'll watch the GIF in the morning. <laughs> it, it also really helps them when a fight is like 10 seconds long and they can, you know, it gets all over social media. Obviously, the intern then has to try and take it all down, but it really helps them in terms of people seeing their shit. Now, I'm not saying that finishing is everything, because when I put out the Filthy Casuals Guide to Vicente Luke, I think he was about to fight Stephen Thompson. Yeah, he lost that one, so it probably was that one. <laughs> Me and my curse. Um, but, you know, he was 9-1 and one in the UFC, and I think he had 9 finishes or 8 finishes. You know, and he was... A couple of those were submissions, but most of them were knockouts. And now people know who Vicente Luke is a bit more. But imagine scoring, like, 7 or 8 knockouts in a 9-fight run you know, and, and not catching on. It's crazy. Like, no, barely anyone knew who Vicente Luke was. Um, so obviously, knockouts are not all there is to it. Uh, charisma helps a little bit too. Even if it's that Jorge Masvidal style of charisma, which relies on you having seen Scarface for the first time recently enough, that you're still like, that's really cool. Um, but like, you know, Leon Edwards, Bilal Mohamed, not very charismatic dudes. Like Leon Ed- Bilal Mohamed said in an interview this week, Leon Edwards needs to talk more or trash talk more. And I've watched some Leon Edwards interviews. People used to talk about like Ross Pearson needing subtitles or Darren Till. Zero trouble understanding them. I have a lot of trouble understanding Leon Edwards a lot of the time because he, had, firstly, brummy accent, but also he's basically a mumbler. So he says funny things, but they're not like very odd. It's not like Darren Till screaming funny things barely coherently um, in a post fight interview. And Malama well, Hammett is actually pretty funny. Like there was a clip of him with Ottman whatever his name is, the guy the guy who got caught smuggling shit into the bubble for the McGregor fight and they released him and then quietly let him back in, probably because of his organised crime connections or maybe Kadarov rang uh, DW. Um, but yeah, he was, he was oh, <laughs> that dude's like doing a, an Instagram video. Periscope, is that still a thing? Uh, and, he, and he's going, I'm here with Bilal Mohammed. And Bilal Mohammed goes, what's in the bag, brother? <laughs> it's just great. Um, ballsy, too. But so, yeah, as I was saying, not, not too incredibly charismatic people. And of course, Leon Edwards, three-fight decision streak, three finishes in 12 UFC fights. Obviously not going to help you catch on. Uh, Bilal Mohammed, two finishes in 12 UFC fights. If you're doing the... Gaethje versus Vic poster. You've got five combined finishes. <laughs> um, and I think that's it's odd because it doesn't speak to how they fight. Um, there are fighters who you, you, you go like, yeah, he's just winning rounds and he's not going to finish anyone. Like Dominic Cruz, you know, for all of how I appreciate him, he's not trying to knock people out, you know, and, and the way that he fights will not knock people out. Um, but when you watch Leon Edwards and Bilal Muhammad, they are hurting people and trying to hurt people. So it's uh, it's kind of odd that they ha- they're such ineffective finishers. But Edwards especially, um, if you look at his UFC run, if you go through his UFC run on um, Fight Pass, he is a completely different fighter between the Sabota fight in uh, March 2018 
and the Sereni fight in June 2018. At that point, he just becomes this clinch machine, and every element of his game becomes better as a result. Like, he came into the UFC quite, t- like, touted as a striker, but the, the first fight, he was fighting, what was it, Claudio Silva, and comes out with a flying knee in the first round, immediately taken down, loses that round, <laughs> you know, and then any time he opens up to strike, he gets taken down and loses the round. He knocks out Seth Bozinski in, like, one punch in his next fight, giving people completely the wrong impression of who he is, <laughs> and then um, beats Pavel Pavlak, meets uh, a, an upcoming Kamaru Usman and gets stuck against the fence. But then it's a run of fights through like Dominic Waters, Albert Tumenov, uh, Vicente Luke, Brian Barbarena, Peter Sabota. All these fights, he's sort of just doing rounded stuff. You know, he'll go for a takedown. He'll use his ground game. He'll do a little bit of striking on the feet. Um, but by the Donald Cerrone fight, Gunnar Nelson, uh, Rafael Dos Anjos, he's seeking out the clinch on his own terms. And he's striking so effectively from there. And it allows him to start standing closer to people and using his feints and work his striking more effectively. Uh, and that's something that you... Like, if you compare the Claudio Silva fight, his very first fight in the UFC, fair enough, but Claudio Silva, um, even like the Tumenov fight, he's striking from a much longer range because he's, you know, it, it's that kickboxer coming to MMA sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, obviously he had a lot of submissions before he got to the UFC. It wasn't uh, knocking people out all the time. But as a UK fighter, probably not a super strong wrestler. And if you're not the strong wrestler and you're trying to strike, you have to worry about wrestling all the time. So you end up coming in over longer distances. Your opponent has more time to react. You become less effective. You start trying to sell out on on flying knees and high kicks and shit. And um, you you lose rounds as a result. And even if you don't lose rounds, you, you strike much less effectively than you could. Whereas if you watch the Cerrone, the Nelson, the Dos Angeles fight, to be honest, to a degree in the Luque fight and the Barbarena fight, this is coming through too. Um, but he's just able to stand close to his man. He's able to use feints. He's able to get movement. I mean, obviously, the other thing about long distance striking, like worrying about the opponent dropping on your hips or whatever, um, or just entering a clinch, is that your feints are not nearly as effective if you're so far out that the guy can give you time. You know, if you're standing so far back, that I don't really need to worry if your shoulder twitches because I know you've got a step. That's not a big deal. If you're standing almost on top of my lead foot because he's a southpaw and then your shoulder starts twitching, I have to worry about that. And the eye is hypothetical in this one. I'm not going to fight Leon Edwards. <laughs> but, um, you know, the difference that range makes is so important. And the comfort getting into range is what has basically changed entire styles in MMA. Like Dustin Poirier, you know, not nearly the same thing because he was a bit more confident uh, wrestling but the big changes in his game come from well i mean th- this is what i'm writing in the in the uh, advanced striking dust emporia that i'm doing but the big changes come from when he's st- he developed this style where he was running to, to basically run people down because the big the mma answer to striking is to move back because it's a counter to both wrestling and striking to just leave range so dust emporia got good at shifting through and running people down but that got him to a certain point and then he wasn't as effective because his answer to the opponent's offense was to either cover up or run away. You know, he was doing the same thing as his opponents were doing. When he got good was when he got comfortable standing in front of the opponent and being, you know, not in the pocket in like the boxing terms, but in striking range of the opponent and holding that striking range. Because that's when the jab becomes an issue. That's when the counter left hand from the shoulder roll becomes an issue. That's when he can dig those body kicks straight out of his stance. If you watch those Alvarez fights where he's, and to be honest, the McGregor fights too, but, or Jim Miller, he's in range. It's not like the first fight against McGregor where he's in and out, you know, where he's running in and then running out. But that's what's happened with Edwards lately. Like he has learned to get in range of his opponents. And a lot of that is confidence in the wrestling, but also confidence in the clinch. While clinch fighting has always been like valued in MMA because everyone saw what Randy Couture could do doing it. It is still a really underdeveloped part of the MMA um, game. You know, you see the odd performance like Jones versus Teixeira, where you see the potential for it, but so few guys are good at doing it consistently. And a lot of it is to do with the head post. And I think there's a lot of um, reductionism. Reductionism? Is that a thing? There's a lot of just like oversimplifying things and um, being very flippant about it. You know, like these MMA guys could learn something from Muay Thai. And yes, there are amazing clinch fighters coming up now, like Petter Yan, who has been training at Tiger Muay Thai for however long, but Tiger Muay Thai is an MMA gym. You know, I think they do have some guys competing in Muay Thai now, but you know, it's, it's an MMA gym. The important point I'm trying to make is that Muay Thai to MMA is not even close to a one, like a one-to-one 
changeover. You know, Muay Thai. There are so many great clinch fighters in Muay Thai who just wouldn't be like even if they were confident wrestling, they wouldn't be able to do it the same way in MMA. If you watch the clinch in Muay Thai fights, guys want to get knees off just like before one of them stumbles over or the referee gets in between them or whatever, and they're throwing like round knees and things all day. And the, typically, if they're good, they'll get their bodies together so the other guy can't knee effectively. And then you're throwing like round knees, which while annoying, are not worth the effort in MMA. Because think of how many fights you've seen where, like, um, the well, I mean, it happened to Augusto Sakai against Overeem. It happened to, I uh, know, Will Harris, it was off a kick against Overeem. But it happened to Augusto Sakai against Overeem. It happened to Juliana Pena when she fought um, Valentina Shevchenko. I mean, that's the most obvious one, actually. You know, Valentina Shevchenko waited for her to throw a knee in the clinch and then just, you know, picked up and swept her off her feet. Now, that happens all the time in Muay Thai. Guys fall over doing knees all the time. Guys fall over doing kicks all the time. And I feel like a lot of people miss that when they're saying like, oh, you just need to train some Muay Thai. You know, they need to look at these Nak Muay. You, know? um, you don't have the freedom to do that. You don't have the freedom to open up with lots of knees. You don't have the freedom to take knees that, you know, there are, there are a lot of knees in, it, in Muay Thai that are just sort of busy work because knees are scored well. And in Muay Thai, you know, a lot of the best knees land in the sort of transition between outside and the clinch and the clinch and outside. They don't tend to land when guys are locked up in the clinch in those sort of grinding exchanges that happen in MMA. Now in MMA you do have the luxury of working for long periods from almost static positions. You know, if you push someone into the fence, if you got into that kind of um, dynamic in a Muay Thai fight, the referee would just be like, that's enough, get out, you know, step between you, get back to the middle of the ring, start again. So you've got more time to consolidate and improve your position in MMA, but if you're getting on one leg and risking being foot swept or just picked up and bundled over, or the opponent sneaking out the side door, because remember that half the time all these people want to do is just disengage, um, from a clinch that is, if you've initiated it, you want to get a good position to knee and knee effectively, make the knees count or the elbows or whatever. And Leon Edwards has found the best way to do that. I mean, some guys have been doing it before, but Leon Edwards does it with such a consistency in his last three fights. It's astonishing. Um, and the secret is separating your hips from the opponents. That's you know, not a, a huge surprise to anyone because when you're smushed together, you know, that's the answer to the clinch and moita. If you get your hips close to the opponent's hips, very hard for them to knee. If you use your knee and shin to frame off them so that they can't get their hips closer to you again or, or get something up in between, it makes it a lot more difficult. You've got to make that space and maintain that space to actually knee effectively. And uh, Edwards is terrific at that. And the head post basically governs everything on the cage now anyway. If you watch um, James Krause's fighters, anyone who does a lot of cage work, you know, they're uh, constantly being asked to recycle their head position is quite a common term, which is like when you come chest to chest in a, in a clinch like people fall into in fights all the time, like in boxing, you know, the almost the classical tie-up, but one over, one under, and your head's over the, the side where they've got the underhook and you're like ear to ear. That's the classical 50-50 clinch. If you're trying to beat someone up on the fence or, or work takedowns in a modern context, a lot of the time you want your head on the same side as your underhook. So you've got to get your head over to the other side. You'll hear a lot of the coaches saying recycle head position because if your head ends up on the opposite side as your underhook, they want you to keep your head on the, on the same side, put it into the opponent's head and pummel the underhook on that side so that your head post and underhook are on the same side again, but you're on the other side. But the importance of the head post in fence wrestling is that it keeps the opponent upright while you get inside them and, and um, no uh, misses while you step inside and either throw or drop on a double or, or whatever you want to do you are at an advantage because they are stood upright um, but from a striking perspective the head post lets you bring your hips back you are in a stance where you can start to throw knees punches like john jones against um Teixeira, uh elbows you know paul felder murdered charles Oliveira with an elbow off the head post and it works the other way because the head post is also how you disengage. If you go back to the 1940s, 50s, um, Rocky Marciano versus Ezard Charles or anyone he had hurt, they're trying to hold him over both arms, double overhooks. Uh, and what he does is he posts his head underneath theirs, gets his hips back because once you've got your head underneath the opponents, you, you have that, you've got your spine as a rod and you can move your hips back and create space between your chest for you to get your arms out or pummel your arms back in for better position. It's a very... Um, important thing to be able to do to pummel your head. I mean, like, uh, Chael Sonnen said that Michael Bisping basically ruined a lot of his wrestling in that fight by pummeling his head in. 
But what Edwards has been able to do is when guys duck in to try and um, take him down or get a clinch as Donald Cerrone, Gunnar Nelson, uh, less so da- Dos Anjos, but you know him too. When they come in, he gets his hips back and posts his head immediately so that his back is like a 45 between the floor and uh, upright. You know, uh, he's got his hips behind well behind his head whereas his opponent is upright with like an underhook and trying to go in sideways with their hip uh, I, I might even make a little short fill the casuals guide because Gunnar Nelson it was really obvious Gunnar Nelson wanted the clinch and he was just trying to drive through and he, it was very hard for him uh, head post overhook and the overhooking arm in the in the crotch almost keeping their hips away and um Edwards will just get knees off from there. And the moment that his opponent tries to disengage, he hits him with the elbow. And that's the real secret to why he's been beaten up the last three people he fights, or fought rather. Uh, I'd, I'd say that there's a, you know, he hasn't finished many people in the UFC, but he hasn't finished anyone in the last three, but he's definitely been beating them up worse. You know, if you watch the fights that he did finish, like the Sabota one, um, you know, very sort of evenly matched fight. Uh, and then he gets the, I think it was a rear naked choke or what. Oh no, did, did he TKO Sabota? But yeah, you know, they're always just sort of like tit for tat fights and then he'll get a finish in the third round or whatever. Um, these ones, these last three, he has beaten them up. And the elbow on the break is so key to that. The knee is, the knee from the head post is the weapon that he uses. Sometimes when his back's on the fence, if he can make space to get a good knee in, he, he's, he wins people with them. But the knee, knee off the head post is like his you definitely want to leave the clinch weapon. If they keep pursuing the clinch like Gunnar Nelson tried to sort of side on shuffle in while he's head posting, they'll just keep getting kneed in the the gut uh, and guys just can't keep taking that knee. And as soon as they try and disengage, he hits him with the elbow. And then you add Edwards' willingness to go to the clinch on his own terms. Because, you know, you watched him try to fight out the clinch against Kamaru Usman and obviously you're fighting an uphill battle if Kamaru Usman's already pressed you to the fence. But in the recent ones, Edwards has been going to the clinch on his own terms. Like, the opponent will step into punch, he will duck into the clinch and smother them. And it might not even be a full clinch, but he's using the clinch, he's threatening takedowns. He normally establishes a takedown early to set the threat up. Like, he took down Gunnar Nelson and RDA in the first round when it was thought that they were the guys who were supposed to be trying to take him down. But by doing that, and by, you know, the entrance entrance to the clinch is a fantastic striking weapon too. It's smothering the opponent's punches. And that's what he was doing over and over again against RDA. Um, entering the clinch or entering so close that RDA couldn't really punch effectively, then he'd either be in the clinch or RDA would start trying to step back from the clinch. Either way, he takes the collar tie and elbows to the hand. And the thing that I love about the elbow so much is that you don't really need to aim. You're throwing to your own hand. It's, uh, as Danaher would call it, incorrectly, prior perception. Uh, proprioception, it's, you know, you're just throwing to your own hand. But he's so quick at it. If you watch the one that he knocked down Gunnar Nelson with, he ducks in to threaten, like to smother Gunnar Nelson as he comes in, and within an instant, Gunnar Nelson is backing up and getting clipped across the orbital bone with an elbow and uh, falls to the mat. It's honestly beautiful stuff. But if you watch the Cerrone fight, that's the perfect. Like every single time they clinch, he head posts and he hits him with a knee, and then the moment that they leave the clinch, whether it's Edwards choosing to leave or Cerrone choosing to leave, there's an elbow accompanying it, and it. You know, it's not going to knock everyone out every time, and it hasn't knocked anyone out yet, but it does hurt people and cuts them up. And he cut RDA's eye open in the second round. It immediately starts bleeding into his eye from his eyelid, Uh, and he just starts landing three punch combinations that moment. And then they go back to the corners, corner cleans it up. Third round, not as aggressive. Suddenly he's bleeding again, start punching him in the face again. The power of making people bleed into their eye. You know, the the reason that they stop fights because of cuts, uh, because of cuts almost exclusively because of cuts dripping into the eye because it makes it so much harder to defend yourself. But that comfort in the clinch and the willingness to step in and smother the opponent has basically opened all these doors for him striking. And he's standing so much closer to guys, he's using feints so much more effectively. It's been really remarkable the last three. Now granted, you've got um, RDA who is not really the best welterweight in the, you know, he's he's always struggled at welterweight because it's bas- he's basically there because he doesn't like cutting weight. Um, he's an in-betweeny sort of weight class guy. He's the one that they all want this 165 for because, uh, you know, one, 155 to 170 is the first sort of big jump. And then you get into like 185 to uh, 205 is a real big jump. And then 205 is basically like, if you want to be a heavyweight, you've got to be at least 240. 
Now, obviously, it's percentage of body weight, but that, the, the reason that people get weird about the 155 to 171 is because it's the first big jump. The rest of them are 10 pounds. And then, of course, Donna Cerrone has... He's been declining for a while. He wasn't... Again, he wasn't great at, at welterweight. And a lot of his... Um, when guys were smarter or quicker than him on the feet or, or giving him trouble on the feet, he would just do this shot, which was like bend at the waist and run towards their hips. And, you know, you saw it not work on people like Mike Perry. And then Mike Perry decided to take him down and get swept or whatever it was. But um, Cerrone, not a great takedown artist. Uh, so, you know, there's that too. The Nelson one, I think, you know, while Gunnar Nelson, a lot of people think overhyped, but I think that one held, holds up quite well because Gunnar Nelson was good at sneaking into clinches very quickly and good at taking people down. Um, obviously, the downside of that is that Leon Edwards pretty obviously lost the last round of that one. Uh, one judge gave it to Gunnar Nelson, and that's absolutely insane. I, I checked MMADecisions.com or whatever it's called, and literally no members of the media gave it to Nelson. It's I, there is n If you watch that fight, there is almost no way, well, there is no way you can give it to Nelson. The, the dude was the only person in the arena who gave it to Nelson, including Nelson's own family. But the reason this is interesting is because... Um, well, firstly, I mean, the, the head posts, knees and elbows are interesting anyway. But it's interesting because he's found an effective way to make himself a threat in the clinch, you know, which isn't just taking people down. I mean, does well with takedowns in his top game, but um, it's that facet of the clinch that so many people's games are missing. And it also plays into his striking so well. You know, it, it makes the, the gateway between standing and the floor has always been the most important part of MMA. If you can strike effectively in that, you've given you've got a facet that almost no one else has. However, he hasn't fought an awful lot of very strong takedown artists. Um, you know, Peter Zabota got him down. Gunnar Nelson got him down. The interesting part is Bilal Mohamed is a, you know he's a pretty effective takedown machine. Is he Kamaru Usman? No, but he does give us a bit more of a clue as to whether this sort of strategy or, you know, um, Edwards' new clinch tactics would work against someone like Usman. And of course, get, getting pushed against the fence is still a bit of a weakness in this uh, in this strategy because you still, you know, it's a lot easier to get dominant head position working out towards the fence than it is working back in. And when you're on the fence, you know, there's not any, even if you get your dominant head position, you can't get your hips back behind you because they're on the fence. It's, it's, uh, it's still not great for fighting out of bad spots, but you will see a lot of entering the clinch just before the fence and turning around people. He did it to RDA, uh, did it to Gunnar Nelson. It's especially when he works so well with the single collar tie. Uh, he, if they've eaten the elbow a couple of times, he can step in, take the single collar tie, and as they put their arms up, he'll pivot around them. Um, so I'm very, very intrigued to see how that holds up against Bilal, Bilal Muhammad because Bilal Muhammad is a, a strong wrestler. And Bilal Muhammad has the opposite side of this. Like, both of these guys have fought good guys, but not the best guys. And, then, you know, that's true for a lot of welterweights, which is very strange. You know, um, like Jorge Masvidal, zero wins over current top 10. But Muhammad has sort of the same thing. There's a lot of uh, excitement because of his last few. But then you look at the people he fought and you're like, that sort of plays into what you do. Like Takashi Sato, I was not super impressed with, but that was, you know, the, the one he finished. Um, but like Diego Lima in his last fight just fought the Douglas Lima game plan. And it just was a terrible idea. You know, oh, this guy does up and down combinations and ducks him for takedowns. I'm going to stand on the fence and maybe throw a couple of low kicks. <laughs> just, what are you doing? Whereas someone like Tim Means, obviously a bit earlier in his career, had a lot more success circling off the fence or Randy Brown even circling off the fence. You know, one of the things that I've noticed about Muhammad, game striker, Really likes to establish his hands and then level change. And, you know, that sort of Sean Shirky boxing into takedowns doesn't really use cage position that well unless it's given to him like on a platter, like that Diego Lima fight. Diego Lima just standing on the fence and blah, my head's like, oh, cool, okay, I'll just drop on your hips and smush you. I do think that uh, Mohammed's an interesting matchup for Edwards in the standing portion of the fight uh, anyway. That Tim Means fight I mentioned was an interesting example. You know, he was having trouble with Tim Means' long left hand. You know, interesting especially because he's a southpaw and Edwards is a southpaw, and also giving up height and reach to the southpaw. But Means was lancing with his long left hand and the, the odd jab, and then just through the fight, Mohammed was able to start getting his read and putting his uh, left hook across the top, or like, a, you know, a sort of arcing left hand over the top. 
And he does always throw in combination, which is good. If you you know using those combinations into level changes, really effective. Like the ones against um, Takashi, Takeshi Sato were fantastic. He was going head body head or body head body. You know he was just going up and down. And I really enjoyed those. Um, the downside is that he tends to sort of he's very impressive in that he covers a lot of ground with his strikes, um, but it does mean he sort of lunges in on people. Like the the knockout loss to uh, Vicente Luke. You know Vicente Luke. He can be, you know, considerably slower than you, and you can beat him to the punch all day. But everything you land on him, he's going to follow with a left hook. You <laughs> know, there's going to be a, a picture perfect left hook just in front of him. And if your head happens to be there for too long at any point, you're going to get it knocked off. And that's exactly what happened to Mohammed. He just sort of lunged in uh, as Vicente Luke covered up. Vicente came out of the cover up and slapped him with a little left hook across the point of the chin, knocked him out. I think what's especially interesting in this one is that I believe it's. Uh, Mohammed's first five round fight where Leon Edwards obviously went five, uh, 25 minutes against Dos Anjos and Donald Cerrone. Now I say that's interesting because while Leon Edwards isn't a great finisher and um, you know wins fights over the distance a lot of the time, he still tends to slow down towards the end of his fights. You'll remember in the, the fifth round Donald Cerrone was finally able to get some stuff going. Um, Dos Anjos not so much. But uh, Gunnar Nelson, like that was the third round even, you know, that was the, the three rounder that he took. But Gunnar Nelson had way more success in the third round than he did during the first two. So I'll be interested to see how uh, Mohammed's pace, which has always been really good over three rounds, holds up over five. And if he can um, take enough out of Edwards to, to really take control of the third, fourth and fifth. But yes, a very intriguing fight. Um, I think they're both sort of more of a nuisance at the moment. Like, wh what do you do with either of them? If they win, you've got Usman possibly booked in for tough against uh, Jorge Masvidal. So maybe winner of this one gets Stephen Thompson to sort things out. Or Colby's got to fit in somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's a good division, so you're not starved for matchups. I'm just wondering what they're going to do or what the plan is. But the rest of this card, you've got... Um, well, Danny Ige versus Gavin Tuck is the other one I'm quite excited for. Obviously... Massive change up for Ige, who was preparing for Ryan Hall. Ryan's out injured. Um, and it's interesting because going through Leon Edwards' fights this week, I couldn't help but think that there were some similarities in his recent run to Ryan Hall, in that he's doing good things against decent people, but the gaps between them are getting longer. And uh, obviously, while your win might look good at the time, if that person goes on and loses again, and then again, you know, just because they they keep fighting and you are uh, on the sidelines, it, it can really hurt perception of you. So Ige's coming off decision loss to uh, Calvin Cater. Before that, he was on a streak of about six wins. But there was the, you know, the, just before that, there was the, uh, but previous to the Cater fight, there was the Edson Barboza one, which he won a split decision in. Lots of people thought he didn't deserve that. He won a split decision over Mirsad Bektik before that. The theme with Dan Ige has been that he won't use his great, uh, greatest strengths like he's an incredible grappler does great work along the fence uh and then he chooses to like stand and bang with edson barboza and in a way that doesn't even play into edson barboza's weaknesses in the stand-up you know edson barboza back him onto the fence he has a nightmare but danny gays like throwing three or four punches and darting out the side door releasing all the pressure and letting barboza just continue being in the center of the cage it was very strange so i was quite interested in seeing how he uh fought Ryan Hall, you know, someone who is so obviously strong in one area. <laughs> like, does he just dive into a leg entanglement right off the bat? Um, but Calvin Cater, you know, another weird fight where he just didn't really, um, you know, not an awful lot of low kicks in that fight from my recollection, which is something that you want to see lots of against Cater. But um, but a big old featherweight. I mean, he's, he's listed as 5'7", whereas Gavin Tuck is listed at 5'6", but he's got like six inches of reach on him. Now, granted, all those stats are <laughs> measured by, it seems like you get to measure your own reach in the UFC and height and just tell people what you think. But, uh, you know, Ige has always looked bigger in fights. Um, but I've always got the impression that Ige's bigger. But, you know, we'll see when they get in the cage. Um, Gavin Tucker, obviously a guy I've liked for quite a while. Southpaw throws lots of lovely left kicks, uh, low kicks into the inside of the lead leg and body kicks. Does a great double pump high kick. So he'll pick his left leg up, like his left knee up slightly, to fake the kick and then put it down just in front of where it started to push off, drive his lead foot forward, and then kick again. So he's making some distance through the fake. 
And he did that to James and, and to the quarantine man, Billy Quarantino. Um, caught them both with little high kicks over the top, but just sort of glanced them. But it's a really nice little uh, move that he does. Does a lot of uh, f- like round kicks to the body, front kicks to the body, and then stepping up the middle with the knee to the head, uh, which is an interesting one for him because a lot of his opponents are considerably taller than him. James wasn't as tall, so he did a, he was able to get a, a good knee up the middle and wobble James. I mean, according to this, Ige isn't much taller than him either, so he might be able to get off against him. But um, the other thing from Tucker that you've been seeing a lot lately is a willingness to wrestle. And there's always sort of like a mixed feeling with that because like, I've just praised Leon Edwards for doing it loads. But sometimes it feels like someone's doing their B game just to do it or it doesn't quite play in with their main game as well uh, he did use it really well to slow down billy uh billy q and just stop him from like bum rushing in the first round uh, and then he got out in the open and started striking effectively again but the thing that i noticed with him was that um sung woo Choi and uh rick glenn both of whom were uh, considerably taller than him gave him a bit of trouble and Sung, like Rick Glenn beat him up that was a very impressive performance from Rick Glenn and Sung Woo Choi he ended up sort of taking down because he was struggling to really get to work on the feet so I think it'll be interesting as Gavin Tucker goes through this division as he starts meeting some of the the bigger framed guys who can still cut to this weight you know like when we watched um you know BJ Penn it used to be like he drains himself completely to get to lightweight. He won't fight a lightweight even. He, he prefers to fight a welterweight because it's such a cut. And then finally, one day, he comes down to featherweight sort of as he's getting older, which is supposed to be harder to cut weight as he's getting older. And he fights Yaya Rodriguez, and Yaya Rodriguez looks like two weight classes bigger than him. Some of these guys cut so much weight. I'm very intrigued to see what happens when uh, Gavin... T- well, if Gavin Tucker gets to fight sort of the Yaya Rodriguez's, the Zabits, you know, those very tall, rangy guys for the weight class. Now, I think um, if you talk about game plans, like Danny Ige should be going forward at all times and keeping pressure on Gavin Tucker because he has decently strong wrestling uh, and he's probably more of a threat in top position than Tucker is. I've actually been impressed with him off his back too. Uh, there was a fantastic one where, oh, uh, who was he fighting? It was in the UFC, but he, like they stood over him and he took a cross grip inside the cuff of their glove, which is completely illegal, and uh, used it to do a, a cool um, tripod sweep. But... He does fight with the sort of confidence that he's fine being taken down. Um, the the thing about Ige is that he feels like a fighter who sort of wants to have a go at everything. So you see him changing stances, he'll kick, he'll uh, do darts and, and all sorts of stuff. It's like he wants to show that he's game to try all this stuff on the feet, but you know, whereas he could taper it down what he does and get more results out of it, you know, specifically in the standing position. It was like the cater fight, he kept switching to southpaw and throwing like, uh, lead leg sidekicks uh, to to the lead leg, but he wasn't really doing anything with them. Like he he switched to southpaw, throw a low, low line sidekick, switch back to orthodox and circle around. You know, it wasn't it wasn't serving any particular goal. It wasn't part of no strategy. It was just I mean it'd be fine as a point scoring technique on his own, but he didn't do it enough for it to be a consistent nuisance for Cater. But I think what's quite interesting about this one is that a lot of Gavin Tucker's striking relies on uh, his kicking. And he's shifting. He's really good at throwing the left. Like he's good at darting down the side with the left with the left straight too. Uh, but he's also good at the using the left straight to back the opponent up and then coming shifting through into orthodox and throwing the right hand. Does really well with the uppercut. Hit Billy, Billy Quarantino with a, a good right straight, which I put up on Twitter the other day. Um, I've seen him do it with the right hooks. Like the James one, they're just trading that shift in and change stances to uppercut over and over again. But that relies on the opponent giving ground. I think that Ige. You know, he's decent at slipping and countering. Like, you know, he uh, I said he's game and he, he does counter box quite well sometimes. And he's got pretty heavy hands for the weight class. Um, so I, I think it'd be fun to see him s- try and stay on the front foot, keep uh, Tucker, keep Tucker's back towards the fence. And anytime the left, anytime the left hand comes, try and get under it and throw the right hand over the top or move into the clinch. If you're moving into the clinch, you're probably a bit safer from the knees, which Tucker's very good at throwing. So try and put himself in that distance so that Tucker cannot use... Well, firstly, if you keep him on the back foot, not going to be able to use the kicks as well. If you're threatening the clinch and the takedown, also makes people very reluctant to kick because you're, especially with the round kicks, you're giving so much room to get inside and you're locking yourself onto one leg while you do it. You're, you're kicking while going backwards, not technically impossible, but very difficult to do well because really what to get any power on the kick you have to give ground and kick as the opponent moves on to it it's more a timing issue 
Uh, and if you keep the opponent under pressure and you don't give them that gap where they can slide back and then kick, uh, you know, they're very reluctant. They'll be very reluctant to kick because they'll be giving you so much chance to work while they're on one leg. But yeah, I think I think Dan Ige, if he sticks, if he pressures in, sticks to Gavin Tucker's chest and roughs him up, you know, collar tie uppercuts and things like that. I think this is a great fight for him. However, I can also see him standing out of kickboxing range and trying to trade kicks and punches like a, just at long distance, which would be very much in Tucker's interest. One of the things that Tucker does to break the pressure is to just duck in and get the double underhooks and turn the opponent on defense. He's a bit of a powerhouse, you know, short, stocky guy for that weight class. Um, and he does decently with like short outside trips and things. It's not, you know, it's, it's not Habib Nurmagomedov, Kamaru Usman stuff on the fence, but it is um, decently effective and it breaks up the pressure and it stops people trying to just walk him down. I think the more this plays out at distance, the more it favours Gavin Tucker. Uh, even if, to be honest, like Ige still wins some fights where he makes where he just makes baffling decisions. But um, I think if, if one if he does want to fight like way out in the open for whatever reason to prove a point or something, I think going southpaw for good periods would actually be a good. Uh, decision in this fight because so much of Gavin Tucker's game is based around working from that open stance. So I'm very interested to see how this turns out because uh, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of like the main event too. I think they're both fighters who are good, could be great. And when I say great, you know, if you're in the UFC, you're already one of the great fighters in the world, probably. <laughs> you're top 1% of the population of even professional fighters, probably. Um, but when I say great, I mean like top five fighter in the world, title shot sort of stuff. Actually, it's probably not even best to divide it by that because you can just wander into, you know, it's, it's all timing and luck. Like if you're if you're around and winning at the right time, you might get a title shot, even if you're not one of the best fighters ever. But by great fighter, I mean like someone who in a couple of years after they've retired, you'd still go, yeah, they were a pretty great fighter. Um, and I think they're both within like touching distance of that. And the main event, I think they've all got incredible skills. I think that some of them, some of the ways they use their skills don't synergize. Danny is the especially obvious example because uh, he will just fight in ways that don't work to his strengths at all. And I think this is part of the bigger topic of like well-roundedness in fighting. Um, because, you know, like people want to call uh, Habib the greatest ever or whatever. You know, he's one of the best fighters I've ever seen. But... I wouldn't say he's one of the best strikers I've ever seen. I wouldn't say there's all sorts of parts of his game specifically. Like I wouldn't say he was one of the best low kickers I've ever seen, you know, but he was able to work it all together in a way that accentuated his strengths. You know, it's not as simple as just diving on. I mean, sometimes he did dive on a low single, but it's not as simple as just doing the one thing over and over again. He did use striking and wrestling and grappling all together in his own way to get the best out of his game. I think that's what I look for in roundedness nowadays. You don't need to be able to do everything. No one can. I think you need to be able to attack from every position. I think that's the, the key. If you have something you can hurt or threaten people with in the clinch, uh, on the ground, orthodox, southpaw, you know, if you've got a few things, you don't need that many, but as long as you are threatening as, in as many places as possible, or in ways that funnel that person into the thing that you are very, very good at, I think that's what roundedness is. More than, I just have to stop the other guy from doing anything that's the one thing I like. It's like obsessing over like defensive wrestling or sprawl training or anything like that. You know, I, I think roundedness is not shutting yourself out of other parts of the game. It's embracing those and using them even against people who might, you know, we might on paper say, they're the stronger wrestler. He won't want to engage him in the clinch and then suddenly you do and you're slicing them up with elbows or whatever. Or maybe even surprising them and putting them on their back, you know? Anyway, uh, enough about roundedness. Let's talk about some of the other stuff on this card. Nasrat Hakparast fighting um, Ryan Garcia, who is 12-0 and 0 and he's number two on um, Topology's Mexican rankings. Coming in from Combate, um, was their lightweight champion. Haven't actually seen any of him, so that would be very interesting because Hakparast is a good measuring stick. I mean, he's a very tricky measuring stick to come in against straight away. Um, and Hakparast, obviously, always fun. Uh, really good pressure fighter. Hani Yaya's fighting Ray Rodriguez. Um, you know, Yaya is getting so long in the tooth. This guy has been around so long. I did a whole article on him just because he did some interesting stuff in that Barzola fight for the Patreon boys. And I pulled up some footage of him 
uh, competing against Leo Vieira back in ADCC. And Leo Vieira was a kid at that ADCC. And Leo Vieira is now retired and teaching in sort of like a a, a coach with a paunch. And Haniyaya is still here. And he's still doing a lot of the same stuff. The deep half entries, the head outside single. And it's all quite weird stuff. You know, it's not really caught on as the meta of MMA. He's still sort of a a, a unique character. By no means like top 10 in the world anymore, but he's still... Um, has some very fun fights from time to time. We are going to get to the point, though, where he's getting knocked out, like, needlessly, and he's going to have to retire, but at the moment, he's doing fine. Courtney Casey versus JJ Aldrich. My girl, JJ Aldrich, with her giant forehead. Um, she, she's actually really fun. I enjoy her. And Courtney Casey, I also quite enjoy. I really enjoyed... What did she fight? Um, Michelle Waterson. I think she got a, a fun fight out of Michelle Waterson, which is a, a feat. Uh, Ginny Frey's on the card, the girl with the best arms at... Uh, well, it used to be atom weight, but now it's straw weight, too. And by best arms, I mean fantastic peaks on those biceps. <laughs> I don't really care about her hands or boxing. Um, and did she fight Loma Lukbumi in her last one? Yeah, I thought she looked all right when she um, when she actually pursued the takedown, but she did seem to really lack urgency. And I was like, you're in, you're in a three round fight, and you're but you know, I she was the Invicta champion, um, so she's had she's probably had a couple of five rounders. But if you're a women's strawweight. You are not going to be in five round fights until you get a title shot. So you've got to get some fucking urgency going there. Angie Hill's on the card against Ashley Yoda. That'll be interesting. Um, Eric Anders versus Darren Stewart for the title of mm, not quite there yet middleweight. Uh, Matthias Niccolo is taking on Manel Cape. Manel Cape's back. That's interesting. And again, this is the urgency thing. Manel Cape came into his UFC debut, did fine, landed an okay amount of punches, looked sharp when he threw but didn't do nearly enough. And then he pursued a couple of takedowns, got the back body lock, and treated that like that was winning. You know, he, he when the scores were announced, he looked like, why didn't they score my takedowns? When he didn't really get takedowns, he just got back body locks. Davy Grantson, he was looking good in his last one. Knocked out Martin Day with a left hook. When was that? Oh, that was back at the Usman um, Masvidal fight. And then uh, your co-main event, for some reason, is a light heavyweight bout between Misha Serkinov and Ryan Spann. I feel like Ryan Spann has climbed the rankings while never winning did i who have i seen him i saw him look bad against big Nog. sorry little nog but win oh he did choke devin clark to be fair and then he got a split decision over sam alvey even the most avid communist is not going to accept that one and uh johnny walker knocked him out yeah so ooh, what how how are you in the co-main event and misha Serkinov. We went from being super hot on him when it was him and uh, Krilov met up and they both had amazing records and, and we were so excited about the future of light heavyweight. And uh, then it was crap. It was like they had a decent fight, uh, but then they both just went on to not be that special. Uh, Serkinov got knocked out by Johnny Walker. God, these guys, it's just two guys who helped make the Johnny Walker myth. Um, and then he Peruvian necktied Jimmy Crew. Oh, that was it. Yeah, no, he stole Jimmy Crute's, um lost virginity uh, in his last one because we were all excited about Jimmy Crute too but yeah fair enough Serkinov I will give you a second chance I was going to do some questions but I've rambled on for like an hour so we'll cut it there today I will be back probably Monday let me know if Wednesday works better for you on the pre-fight stuff and uh, I'm probably going to write something for the Patreon boys this week or pop up a, a short filthy casuals guy but now I have the freedom to go and decide what that is without a, a deadline on me so if you want to get in on the extra stuff for patrons support the podcast, be a boy, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, and they are going to get answered, I promise, uh, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Danny Gay's black belt in game planning, bless.